There's a certain time of day and a certain time of year when the sun sets and the weather cools, where the leaves change and the winds chill. Light retreats, darkness advances, and imagination takes over. It all occurs during that brief period of time known as the Twilight Tower Zone. Witness the literary prowess of one Mr. Doug Walker, an entertainer who screamed his dreams into existence, criticizing the nostalgic. Now, with a once vibrant world shut down, Mr. Walker has been returning to his roots, writing the perfect script for more months than he cares to count. No interruptions, distractions, or interference. But little does he know that he's about to become the main character in his own story, a story that can only be found in a small dark corner of the Twilight Tober Zone. Time Enough at Last may very well be the most well-known Twilight Zone episode ever made. It stars the incomparable Burgess Meredith and was directed by John Brom. Brom directed the most Twilight Zone episodes of anyone, including five in the first season and one more with Meredith in the lead role. This episode has taken on much significance in pop culture, even to this day, for its ending, which we'll discuss in the twist section. It was based on a 1953 short story of the same name by Lynn Venable in If Magazine. Rod Serling expanded on it for his purposes and made it one of the most memorable episodes of television in history. In fact, it was ranked at number 11 by TV Guide when they counted down the top 100 episodes of television in 2009. It's been homaged and parodied multiple times from Family Guy to Fear the Walking Dead, and it still holds up today. Henry Bemis is a bookish bank teller who spends every moment he can reading. He's often found reading books on the job to the point where his boss, Mr. Carsville, threatens to fire him if it happens again. Even Bemis's wife, Helen, hates his habit so much that she hides his books and crosses out all the pages of one he kept hidden from her. Bemis is a meek man and doesn't fight back much against their abuse. One day, he decides to take his lunch break in the bank vault so he can have some time reading without being scolded by his boss. In the middle of his leisure time, an atomic bomb goes off outside, killing everyone and everything. Bemis emerges from the vault unharmed and walks through the ruins of his town, only to discover how alone he truly is. If you know anything about me, you know I'm a huge Rocky fan. I grew up watching Burgess Meredith as Mickey Goldmill in those films and have a real fondness for him. And I know I'm not the only one. Many people often cite his portrayal as the Penguin in the 60s Batman show, but Meredith was a very popular actor even before all that. He was in movies like the 1939 version of Of Mice and Men and the 1945 film Story of G.I. Joe, just to name a few. His Twilight Zone appearances, starting with this one, deepen his legendary career, and Time Enough at Last became one of the pieces of media he's still most known for. His portrayal of Henry Bemis absolutely makes this episode work. He changed his voice, demeanor, and mannerisms to match that of a nervous but unassuming person. His glasses were so distorted he couldn't see out of them, so they only used those lenses for the close-up shots. He also sported a fake mustache to get the character to look that certain way. Burgess comes off extremely likable and sympathetic as he's constantly talked down to by those around him. Why, Helen? Why do you do these things? Because I'm married to a fool. Later, when he's walking around in his destroyed neighborhood, you feel even more sorry for him. Yes, I'm really extremely fortunate. Help. Help. Serling seemed to be a big fan of his work, writing characters for Meredith in three more Twilight Zone episodes, and even offering him the lead role in a spin-off series. Burgess ended up turning that down, but there's no denying there was an obvious strong connection between Serling's writing and Meredith's acting, despite the two men not being close on a personal level. As phenomenal as he was in the role of Henry Bemis, Meredith is far from the only thing to love about Time Enough at Last. As mentioned earlier, John Brom was a staple of this series, directing 12 episodes. This was the first one to air, and it may have been the peak of his work on the show. The visuals are both striking and beautiful. After the bomb goes off, Bemis returns to a world in ruins. It's a pretty dark moment, but I love this little sequence of Bemis seeing what's become of his boss. As I've mentioned already, 
Miss Jackson, that's my speech for the Thursday night banquet. Would you type that up in triplicate? This is all done very minimalistically, choosing to keep the scope of the destruction close to the character. The set design and backgrounds are done incredibly well. Cinematographer George T. Clemens captured this sense of destruction with a delicate hand. He used a blue filter to bring out more of the painted clouds and stormy skies. It was so unorthodox at the time that when he had someone fill in for him for a half day, they were scared to death of how to utilize it properly. But you can't argue with the results. The bank vault was also built on springs so the camera and set could shake at the same time when the bomb exploded outside. Even the foreboding clue of the newspaper headline and wonderful visualization of the book flying open and pocket watch glass shattering were very effective small moments in the final product. Safe to say, this one has a look to it that didn't come along very often on the show. After wandering around for hours, finding food and a place to rest, Bemis contemplates suicide as he seems to be the only person left alive. But he eventually comes upon the ruins of the public library. Most of the books are intact and he sees himself as saved. He now finally has the time to read as much as he always wanted. But as fate would have it, Bemis then utters the most famous lines in the show's history. There was time now. There was, was all the time I needed. What a great scene. Well acted, directed, and shot. The steps were located on the MGM backlot and decorated perfectly. It looks fantastic in the last crane shot, pulling away from Bemis. Rod Serling very rarely lets something bad happen to a good main character at the end of his Twilight Zone scripts, so this was a bit of a sad, pathetic shocker. I feel so sorry for Bemis that I kind of wish that he was written as a character more deserving of his fate, but that may not have made for such a memorable story. All in all, Time Enough at Last might just be the quintessential Twilight Zone episode. If you've never seen it, give it a watch. It's not my personal number one favorite episode, but it's high up there and positively stands the test of time. Haha! -ha! Finished! My masterpiece is fine! completed! Oh, 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 they laughed before! Well, no, they didn't. That was the problem. But now they will! <laughs> oh, yes, yes. <laughs> no. Oh, that's not fair. That's not fair at all. There was time now. I had all the time I needed. <laughs> Melvin, Melvin, brother of the Joker. Melvin, Melvin, brother of the Joker. Melvin, Melvin, brother of the Joker. I'm cool. The best laid plans of comic book clowns and their brothers. And Doug Walker, a formerly spectacled man who had nothing but time. But time matters not when technology devours a man's dream. A dream may be best kept locked inside the Twilight Tober Zone.